All right. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Charu. I work for uh, Paytm. Uh, I manage all the <coughs> data science uh, and machine learning teams at Paytm and build several products there. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the personalization story at Paytm, right? So I'm going to talk about our journey, which we have taken in about last year and a half. Uh, <clears throat> I want to tell you state of the union, where we are at, uh, where we are going. Um, and we'll also talk about, you know, uh, different points in time. <clears throat> how did we pivot uh, and how did we uh, go about building what, whatever we have today in terms of personalization? So agenda is very simple. So we will talk about why do we first, why do we care about personalization at Paytm? Uh, it seems like it's a very large uh, payments company. Um, <clears throat> then we will talk about the evolution of, you know, how did we, uh, just describing you our journey. Uh, and then finally, how, how we engineered a very large scale personalization system, right? Um, okay. Something about our scale, most of you have heard uh, uh, about us. I'm assuming most people know what Paytm is. <clears throat> uh, if you had lunch today, you could have actually paid using uh, the QR code solution um, uh, that we built. So something about our scale, we have 100 million plus products uh, and we work in over 2000 categories and you know it's a very wide variety we go from right from marketplace product like e-commerce products cell phone covers uh, to fashion accessories um, then we sell travel tickets we sell movie tickets <clears throat> we um, we enable a lot of offline payments um, uh, we sell deals name a category we probably have it right um, <clears throat> so that's why we have very large number of categories and hence very large uh, product set. We have about 100,000 sellers uh, in marketplace alone and about 6 million plus offline merchants. And the reason I'm talking about these numbers is not to advertise but to uh, tell you about the scale, right? So when you have a scale like this, <clears throat> most of, uh, uh, you know, most of the out-of-box recommender systems, whatever people have done in past, kind of starts failing, right? So even your standard databases, standard technologies that you can use to build these, all of that starts failing. And that's when real innovation happens because you actually have to go and build it uh, to match your scale, right? Obviously, we have 220 million customers. Most of you have heard this. We have 80 million plus monthly active users, uh, which is a very huge number. That means that people are coming <clears throat> um, back on the app, back on the website. Um, and then every time they are there, you actually have to serve them um, um, some kind of products, right? All right. So personalization at this point, at this scale, um, think about the categories that I talked about earlier, right? You're selling travel tickets and hotel packages on one side, you know, which can cost you a few thousand rupees. Uh, and you're selling uh, <clears throat> a fashion accessory uh, or bazaar products, if some of you have um, uh, been shopping at Paytm, which can cost you uh, <clears throat> tens of rupees or a few hundred rupees, right? Uh, that's such a huge variety. So if I, how do I actually rationalize what should go on my homepage? How do I rationalize what should go on individual category pages? How do I actually start driving traffic to each one of these pages? It is a very difficult problem to solve. <clears throat> so variety of offering is our number one reason. Number two is we, uh, when we talk about marketplace itself, we have a very long tail assortment of products, right? Um, so we have uh, roughly 100 million plus products in, in our marketplace catalog alone uh, uh, coming out of 100,000 merchants, which basically means that not every product is going to sell. Um, some of the products won't even sell once in a year, right? And this is actually a typical retail problem. It is, uh, <clears throat> it is not unique to us. The uniqueness here is in the scale, right? Um, then transaction is king, right? So I mean, we are not a content website. So uh, uh, today we are not a content website. So it's not like I want you to come and spend half an hour every day on the website. I want you to come and do a transaction. And I want you to, I want to make that experience so seamless for you that when you come, I know what, why you have come here. And I basically show that to you upfront so that you can actually just come, do your transaction and get out. I don't want to come um, in your way. That's the whole idea. <clears throat> and then, uh, like I said earlier, in any digital business, basically you always have, um, again, a long tail of properties also. 
right? So you have a long tail of products, you have a long tail of properties. What that means is you will have very few properties which are very impactful. People can come there uh, and, and people will keep coming there, like your homepage, typically. Um, that's a very attractive uh, proposition. But as you go <clears throat> down in the tree, um, there will be some pages which will get, let's say if your homepage is getting a 10 million views per day, some of your other pages will get traffic of, uh, let's say, 100 views in that particular day, right? So <clears throat> that's why uh, the premium properties are limited and it is kind of an obligation for us to to make sure whatever we are putting on our premium properties is something which is very, very useful um, for our customers. By the way, putting something on our premium property can make or break a business, right? Um, so we have to be very cautious uh, about that. And this is exactly why personalization was not like a fashion V4 type of a product. It is a RAM necessity for us. All right. Let's talk about, so we started this journey somewhere around 2016, early 2016, right? Um, and that's when <clears throat> we were having a lot of discussions. So, so what do you mean by personalization? What are you going to do? So we said, uh, I come from a background where uh, I have been trained to set metrics against every damn thing, right? So I mean, <clears throat> whatever I do, I try to set a metric against that. So because everything should be measurable, right? So we said, let's set some metrics first. And then, um, with the help of some marketing guys, we actually put some nice words also around it. Uh, and that's what I have um, on the slides here. So number one target was objective was customer delight, right? So <clears throat> the simple metric against this is basically if the customers who are coming in are actually um, doing the transaction or not. So if customer will like it, they will obviously do a transaction. If they know that uh, they don't have to spend a lot of time, um, and you know, once they are on the app or once they are on the website, they can see the product uh, <clears throat> that they need, they will obviously buy, right? So that's the first one. So we want to make sure that uh, we are showing the products preemptively to the customers and not everything needs to go through search because search is again a multi-hop multi, multi -hop process and you don't want your customers to go through that pain, right? And remember, like I said earlier, transaction is king. My objective is that you come in and I should show you <clears throat> what you're here for. Uh, you should do your transaction and you should be able to move on. Right. Um, we should show relevant products to a customer based on the prior purchase behavior. This is more like a how. And then the second one is uh, seller delight. Right. We have so many sellers. We are a two-sided marketplace, so we have equal amount of respect for the sellers also. <clears throat> like I said earlier, if I put a product on a home page, it can make or break a business. Right. So what that means is that I need to make sure that I am being. Um, I am being equally just to my sellers and I'm giving them an equal opportunity to sell on our platform because that's what the purpose of a marketplace is. Marketplaces are not meant for one or two sellers to sell uh, the whole thing. <clears throat> and in that regard, um, we, we truly believe in that. Um, and the metric that we set around that was um, <clears throat> uh, the overall spread that a seller gets. So in my top, top row on my homepage, top product row on my homepage, I can literally measure at the end of every every day, every week, every month, how many sellers did I um, end up promoting? And we will we will come to um, you know how personalization actually um, um, made it possible. And then third one is obviously our business objectives, right? So um, my category managers, my business growth managers, I cannot um, leave them alone. They are an equal equally important entity. Uh, in this trinity. So we actually call this a trinity, a triangle. This has come from our uh, CEO. So there is a Paytm triangle, which is customer, seller, and then Paytm business objectives, right? So the Paytm business objectives are in a month, it could be I want to drive a lot of transactions. In some other month, I want to drive a lot of uh, GMV. In some other month, I may want to <clears throat> drive uh, a, a lot of click-throughs. And that, that will be driven by what do I want to achieve in that particular month, right? So I have to, I have to, uh, whatever I'm building, I have to build it in a way that I can uh, kind of respect that. So remember, customer, <clears throat> so I have to make sure that uh, customers are happy and they are getting what they need. I want to make sure that the sellers are happy and they are actually able to sell and it's a just marketplace. And um, Paytm business objectives, which is basically I want to make sure that by making sure that both of them are happy, but we still need to make sure that, you know, whatever we want to drive, we are also able to drive that. Cool. Cool. 
I want to talk about, let's talk about the evolution of uh, personalization now, and then maybe I can just go and talk about uh, uh, where we are at. So again, we started this journey somewhere in 2016, and that's when I was given one top carousel on homepage. Uh, it's popularly called as EDD. Internally, it's basically, it, the name of that list was Exclusive Discount Deals. <clears throat> and I will talk about how we used to build assortment for that, but basically this is a property where we get a lot of, uh, we get a lot of uh, clicks and uh, uh, obviously a lot of visibility, right? And <clears throat> the way to build it was people would go and they will find some of the best deals and they will just put it here, right? Um, so we started with that single carousel. Then we said, oh, it's working out. We, we tested it, we measured it. Uh, <clears throat> we'll talk about the measurement journey also. Um, and we said, okay, now why don't I just put it on all the other high traffic properties also? So let me just pick up one high traffic property after other, which is called a category landing page. As an example, you can go ptm.com slash electronics, and that'll take you on the electronics homepage. And we just started taking one carousel by one carousel on that also. So notice the difference here though, right? If you go to most of the e-commerce companies, <clears throat> they go by a different approach. The general approach is go by the uh, Amazon way. And the Amazon way is that I am going to go in a widget fashion. <clears throat> what that means is that I will build two or three different types of algorithms. So I will measurements are done and we actually baked all of that into our measurements platform. Um, and now, <clears throat> uh, if a customer is getting same type of treatment, then they will continue to get that same treatment uh, across the board so that they, they are not really uh, polluting the experiment. And initially, I was a bit hesitant in doing all that, uh, but now I feel I think that was a great thing that we did, and, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and, and we have seen really good results because of that. So we built experimentation service, then we went on and we did uh, real-time data for evaluating experiments. And we built a really cool reporting uh, tool. I have a few uh, folks here uh, sitting from our uh, uh, data lake team who actually helped us um, <clears throat> build the reporting solution. And now we can literally see all of this data in, in near real time. <clears throat> and the next step of this that we took recently is portfolio balancing. So we had another guy who came from financial math background and he was like, you know what? We, in financial math, basically in uh, 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 people who are doing uh, stocks, <clears throat> uh, their best thing is that their wish, the best wish that they have is basically can they actually go and uh, rebalance their portfolio very quickly, right? So they want to see if some experiment or some algorithm is running and then can they actually go back and they can try and uh, rebalance the portfolio. If this experiment is not working, let me reduce it. Let me increase another experiment which is working. And it is very expensive there, right? Because you always have to pay fees to, to rebalance your portfolio. I told him, why don't you try it here? It's free. And he did it, right? So what we do, <clears throat> which is also called uh, some kind of multi-arm bandit, by the way, um, is that um, we run multiple experiments, right? So we run, um, <clears throat> I want to say we run about 6,000 experiments in a day across different types of lists um, because we run about 2,000 lists and every list has at least two to three experiments running at any given point. We are comparing them in real time, right? And at every hour, if I know that this particular experiment is not working on a particular list, then I will start decreasing the uh, the exposure of, uh, <clears throat> of of that model on, on, on that particular list, and I will start increasing some other experiment. And I, I really like this, because when we will talk about, I, I don't think I talk a lot about um, adoption challenges here. <clears throat> I will talk about that in the end, but um, this, this was one of the, the pivot points that really helped me uh, get adoption of machine learning. People don't believe in machine learning, right? in any organization, um, it is a very hard thing. And <clears throat> I'm not saying um, that only um, for my current company, I've been doing this for 10 years and I have fought this battle multiple times, right? Um, it is hard to convince uh, growth managers, category managers, uh, business managers that, hey, uh, you know, and actually us also, when the self-driving cars will come, it is very hard for me to um, um, digest the fact that I can go completely um, hands off on a self-driving car. Same way um, they think about it. They're like, I'm not gonna go completely hands off. This is my business and you know what? I am actually gonna get bonused on 
if my category is going to do well or not. <clears throat> so they, they don't let you um, go full throttle. This is the same self-driving car problem, right? So <clears throat> this type of a thing, portfolio balancing helps you because what you do is you ask them, well, you don't have to go, uh, you, you don't have to be completely off the hook. And what you do is why don't you go and curate um, a list based on whatever assumptions you have, whatever mental model you have, and then um, we will run it in real time. And then if you are winning, then I should obviously give you more credit and I should increase the exposure. And once I do that, and I've, I've, I'm, uh, I've, I've seen this, and I've not just seen this here, I've seen this um, earlier also uh, <clears throat> in other places I worked, um, that once you have, <clears throat> Once you have built that kind of a repo, once you have given them the tools um, like this, then basically the, the confidence comes and exposure increases. Okay. And the third one is the most interesting one, right? We started with notebooks, and that was my foolish idea. So we started writing our entire pipeline. So we were turning about 20 terabytes of data at that point, building the model, first <clears throat> gathering all the data, um, building the features and then building the models um, and then um, uh, saving the model and, 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 and scoring the model. All of that was done in this very nice notebook environment, which is called Databricks. Databricks was a very new product at the time, right? So it has matured a lot since then. And then, oh, we have scored everything. And now, you know what? If you want to put it in production, you got to run it every day, man. So how do I do that? <clears throat> so I wrote a very simple scheduler. It, it used to come with a, a cron scheduler. We just utilized that. And then we started writing some scripts to basically augment it. And, um, <clears throat> and then we wrote a scheduler. And then I took a flight to India. By the way, I'm based out of uh, Toronto. We have a fairly large data science lab there. And that's, that's where we have built all of this. Um, I took a flight to Toronto. I'm going to launch it. And then midway from London, I get a call that, oh, by the way, this has, this is not working because <clears throat> um, the notebooks are actually not meant for it, and uh, it just cannot handle the scale. And I return back. But the thing there is that it, it is an amazing learning from that, that never again in my life when I will build something like that, I will, uh, <clears throat> I will underestimate the engineering aspect of it. So I did not underestimate the engineering aspect from, from the point of view that oh, uh, you should build solid pipelines. You should understand how you're going to put it in production. But um, you, when you have to do it, when you have to build uh, these production systems, you have to uh, build it properly, right? That was the learning. So we built it in notebooks. Um, it failed. In two weeks, we actually converted it into um, uh, Spark jobs. And, and that was an easy thing for us. Uh, and then in the first version of it, we basically used uh, Elasticsearch. Uh, to, to serve this, we had a very tight integration with our catalog as a serving layer, and we were using that, right? Then we basically started building personalization. Uh, uh, we built this personalization service so that there was some more learnings of this tight integration. So we, we built personalization service, which, uh, again, I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and then finally, we ended up building this uh, real-time scoring thing. So where are we at today, right? So we are personalization everywhere. I think I have repeated this a few times. Um, so we always reach out to customer with very personalized list based on some custom assortment. Um, we can, uh, people don't have to timeshare list. Earlier people were timesharing list, right? So uh, a fashion accessories and the shoes guy will, uh, will do this uh, together. Uh, basically they will try to uh, put same products in the, in, in the same list and so on. Right. I don't think it matters. OK. This is another learning, right? So anytime we have built models, um, basically, I try to take some, uh, we always try to infer some things from you know, how it is actually done in today's world, and then see if uh, you can build intelligent systems that can actually do it. Now, um, in typical world, for any product list like this, exclusive discount deals, anyone who is configuring that, they always start from uh, some catalog, they select some pool of products, and they try to push it there. Uh, it's a mental model which does not ca capture a lot of complexity, and hence it cannot be generalized, right? And you will always have dependency on humans to, uh, to reproduce it. 
so now i want to talk about the personalization framework that we have right and 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 uh, this is very um, standard framework that we have tried to use across uh, uh, different things and the only time something evolves is basically different types of models and the framework is so general that you can mix and match uh, different types of things all right it obviously starts with data lake because that's where you are capturing all the data um, the first step that we do is product pool selection right this is a very cool forecasting algorithm uh, that we have built um, <clears throat> and over the period of time i would say it has gone through four or five iterations maybe um, i have gentlemen here <clears throat> in the crowd who actually built it um, <clears throat> so what we do here is we start with the catalog and uh, basically we take um, we build a very large time series of uh, every product right so for every product how much it sell how much it sold in last one month two months three months and so on actually we do it on on days level right and then we try to predict if i were to give x amount of stimulation to this product um, how much it will sell right so it is based on some time lag variables it is based on visibility it is based on um, uh, how much visibility i am giving how much search terms were there for a particular product um, what is the current discount running on it today how much does it sell when there is no discount running on it and then if i were to give it a 10% discount how much it will sell 20% discount how much and then based on that i basically go and look at every discount that is going to run tomorrow and uh, based on that i can say that this is my approximation it is actually going to sell four units another added complexity here remember i told you in the beginning any item that can go on a home page or on a prominent page can make or break the business that's why you need to have the location of the item as a factor in this right so we take that into account as well so based on that i can basically select some products the next thing is uh we define the category affinities i told you we have 2000 plus precisely we have about 2500 categories uh ish <clears throat> where what we do is um we have gone through several uh iterations of the model i think six or seven now the current one being uh, uh, LSTM, which is being developed. Um, <clears throat> LSTM is being developed now. I think we just put it in production, and before that, it was a uh, semi-connected network. Um, here, we are trying to predict in which category customer is going to be most interested. Because remember, I have already picked up what are the best products in that category that are going to sell, right? So I have already solved that problem. And when I start doing category predictions, which are about 2,500, I'm not talking 10 or 15 categories. I'm talking 2,500 categories. So your shoes and your socks are different categories. In fact, your sport socks and your um, formal socks are actually two different categories, right? I can, we can do prediction. We do prediction at that level. And once I have all of that, then I use an item recommendation. I don't use item recommendation as my starting point. Item recommendation is my end point, right? This is the last point in the journey. <clears throat> That's the main difference. Most of the times when you talk about a recommender system, that's your starting point. Spark comes with, oh, so Spark comes with uh, uh, ALS um, model, and all it does is basically takes your um, view and product uh, 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 view and product signals uh, basically calculate the interactions um, and then basically you run some kind of uh, alternating least square method which they have implemented and then you try to uh, find out which product is <clears throat> is going to be uh, popular if you have seen this other product netflix is doing that amazon is doing that i think that's the most popular uh, thing a and obviously <clears throat> uh, people have used category affinity in past not saying we are the first ones but people do it after the fact. What we are doing is we are doing it before the fact. We start, we have always focused more and more on the category. We are focused on, on this model. And, and lately from last six to eight months, we've been focusing a lot on, the, on this, this other model also. And, and partially because this is actually a very high uh, scaling challenge, item item collaborative filter, right? 100 million products is, is a non-trivial size. After this, remember I talked about I do, I do assembly because remember I talked about my third objective, which was my um, <clears throat> PTM's business objective, which basically says that 
in this month i want to increase transactions in this month i want to increase gmv and so on and so forth in this month i want to increase profitability how do i do that i need to give some kind of levers and that's where some kind of once i have built my assortment this is what i'm going to show to a customer i need to reassort it i need to resort it and that resorting based on um, the inputs that i get and this is an optimization problem that we are trying to solve right a regression problem on your left a category affinity pro pro prediction on the right <clears throat> a collaborative filter which is um, um, a kind of a matrix factorization in your middle and then an optimization problem in the end this is our standard framework and this is what we use um, in all the places i want I'm, I'm happy to go into more depth i see i have only 12 minutes left um, Okay, I'm not going to talk about this. Um, category model is an interesting one. We started with a very simple random forest classifier. It had about 6,500 features, um, and we were predicting only 200 categories at that time when we started. So we said 2,500 categories, no may when. We cannot predict that. So we said, let's go one level up. It's obviously a hierarchy, and we started predicting from that point. Right. Um, uh, uh, it worked out, 200 categories, uh, the precisions uh, were decent, the metric that we use to measure our model always um, is precision at K and NDCG. <clears throat> um, then we basically said, uh, you know, remember I, I said, we will go on every uh, home page, <clears throat> so uh, every category page, that's where we started building a hierarchical classifier. By the way, one thing that we added here was in Spark MLLib, you could not persist the model, especially the random forest model, um, we have actually built that, so we could so we could actually persist the model, and then we could use the model if it's stable enough. So um, I'm happy to share that code at some point. Um, we built this hierarchical classifier again; does not come out of the box. We actually built it. We said let's take all the major categories because there are subtle differences in fashion from electronics. So we started building individual uh, models for each one of them. And then obviously it was a joint probability distribution in the end. If you want to predict uh, at the <clears throat> at 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 the leaf level, or if you just want to predict for that particular category, then you can just use only that model, right? Um, then came this uh, 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 this new model, right? Uh, by the way, this is a very state of the art. Uh, a mechanism for for doing category predictions used by uh, a lot of people. Um, it's based on a paper from Microsoft. Um, what we did was we t we understand that basically uh, user purchases are a sequence, right? <clears throat> it is like a sequence of words. So we use word to vec, right, to build a latent factor, <clears throat> a, a latent space uh, in which we could represent uh, the user purchases, right? So on the left, you basically see user purchases and views, and then we take some target purchase category and we run it through word to vec, right? And that gives me that latent space. This guy, um, this guy over here, this is my latent space. And then I take that latent space and then I run a logistic regression on top of that. And that is why we like to call it semi-deep learning. This is not truly really deep learning because the model is not fully connected, right? Um, so we build that <clears throat> and then finally we were able to get the category prediction. This actually works on all the 2400 categories, right? And now we have done another thing on top of this where I don't have it here, but uh, we basically take the next generation of this model, which has been live for about six months now, it takes time buckets. So you basically think of a very huge stack matrix, which has this user, this latent space, it is stacked by zero to two days, two to four days, four to six days, and so on. And then it is compared against a very large target vector in the end, right? And that's how you run a logistic regression. We tried doing um, uh, uh, basically a fully connected network also um, using our MLP, but uh, the thing is our data set is so huge that uh, we just could not finish it in time. And I need to finish every model in two hours. If I don't, then basically um, um, I'm, I'm late for the right prediction. Basically the precision at K starts dropping. Uh, in collaborative filter, again, we use ALS, but we uh, initially we used ALS. We give it our flavor by giving it, you know, the, the strength, which is the interactions, 
we gave it our flavor where we said that uh, <clears throat> not every interaction is equal. So we built a, a, a custom function which exponentially decayed um, uh, the interaction. Um, and now what we are doing is, and that's why I mentioned the 6 million plus offline merchants in the beginning is because I'm introducing all the payments data in here as well, where I can literally build a function in ALS which just says that uh, <clears throat> I will have X amount of uh, a weight given to interaction from a digital product and a physical purchase. I will have Y amount of weight given to a digital product and a digital purchase. I will have Z amount of weight given to uh, 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 a <clears throat> a physical product and a digital purchase and so on. So I can make all those permutations, assign different weights to them, and uh, that's how, um, <clears throat> and that's basically our variant on, on, on how do we define our interactions. This is another use case where we basically had, uh, uh, you know, even after doing all this, you will always have these corner cases keep coming up. This was specifically done for um, uh, air conditions and TVs, high-end electronics type of categories. And what happened here was uh, we were not showing the right products. So basically what we ended up building was another, so, so similar model, uh, the, the semi-connected network that I showed you, we built a variant of that by using uh, price buckets and brands, right? And this is the TSNE visualization uh, of that. You can see the red ones are the ones which are predicted by this model, and the green ones are the predicted ones predicted by our general model, right? Uh, and the blue is the customer's purchase. You can see that the red dots are actually in path of, um, of, of how customer actually purchased it. This is an interesting one because somebody actually challenged us once and uh, this, is, this graph is just coming from that email. We sent it to them saying that, by the way, you are buying this type of stuff. That's why we are showing you TVs which are very expensive. This is interesting. So now, uh, at every point when we start giving out a recommendation, what we do is we are not serving from one model. It really depends on the type of list that is being created. So we start with a, a customer, um, then at the time of generating the recommendation, we look at a few things. As an example, does this list have categories, multiple categories, more than 10 categories, or is it pr primarily a list which has only products from electronics, or is it primarily a list uh, um, which has products from shoes and, uh, uh, and fashion accessories, that's a mixed kind of a list and so on, right? Um, and based on that, we have built a system where we basically invoke different types of models. So it is not one model, again, that would be another problem with using a vanilla ALS. Where in a ALS, you can you have a very large model, and you're trying to drive, <clears throat> you're trying to treat everyone um, through that same model, right? Whereas in this case, you can have multiple different types of models, multiple variations of deal pool selector, multiple variations of category affinity, and multiple variations of um, your uh, collaborative filter, and then combine them based on the type of prediction that you want to make. Okay, I want to share some very quick results um, on the. Basically, you can see on the left, you can see some lifts in CTR. But basically, 2,000 plus lists are personalized today. We uh, serve about a billion plus recommendations every day. Um, we have seen about a 2x increase in GMV per user, similar type of increase in uh, number of transacting users, number of uh, 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 the units sold per user. Um, and then we have served a lot more sellers than we would have served by doing manual assortment. Uh, this is our overall overall architecture. I'm just gonna finish in like uh, maybe two more minutes. Uh, <clears throat> the overall architecture is basically uh, we have a batch part where we do a lot of uh, feature creation and so on. Um, <clears throat> then uh, let me go to the next one actually. Right. Then we have these three individual microservices. Go going back to that framework. Right. We had three things. So we had a deal pool selector, which is in the middle here. We had a category classifier, and we have, I, we call it white mage. It's basically the collaborative filter, right? These are three independent microservices completely uh, uh, deployed with their own data sources. Uh, I can deploy whatever model I want to deploy there, and so on and so forth, right? And then we have an orchestrator, which is directly talking to something uh, called our serving layer, uh, which is an extension of our catalog. So our catalog, Every time it wants to serve anything, it will first make a call to us. Our measurement system is going to determine what type of model needs to be served. Then, basically, 
we will go to that particular, we will go to the orchestrator, we will tell orchestrator, uh, pull up that model for this customer for DPS, pull up this other model for CC, pull up this other model for white mage. Um, and then all of them send back the results to orchestrator. Orchestrator then goes to another DB, which tells it, uh, <clears throat> in this particular list, my goal is to increase the transactions. Uh, so then it says, okay, so let me pick up uh, um, uh, the optimizer, optimizer or the racking objective which I need to solve for is increase transactions. It re-assorts everything, resorts everything, and then it basically sends it to um, sends the recommended products. And obviously, we do a lot of va validations like is the inventory there or not, is the merchant good or not, uh, has the merchant been blocked or not, and so on. So great. I want to share some learnings. This is my, uh, <clears throat> some of the things that I've learned over the last 10 years. So don't build stuff for yourself because people will not adopt it and, uh, uh, and, and that will just lead to more frustration. So always build for your customer, ask them what do they need. Uh, don't, this is an interesting one that I've learned. Uh, don't build things to present at conferences, build to add value to business, right? Always do that, please. Uh, <clears throat> because, when you add value to the business, you will get a lot more ideas, and 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 then you will be actually able to build something which you can present at a conference. So it works the other way around. Um, change is hard and messy. Adoption is very very hard. <clears throat> Machine learning adoption used to be even more harder five years ago, right? Um, it, now because AI is a buzzword, business managers are coming around. Uh, there is a top down push, so people are adopting it, <clears throat> but it's hard. Find a business partner get executive sponsorship, but more importantly, find a business partner and they will help you get through this, right? Um, engineering first. So models are absolutely useless. They have zero value. Charu, if they cannot sorry go in for production. interrupting you, but yes. you overshot your time. <laughs> okay, I'm almost done. And just start small and keep at trading. Thanks guys, sorry I took longer.